Good morning. It's always so epic. I don't know if we have to keep that in our future videos. Um, good morning and welcome. My name is Heather. I am Pastor Jean's wife. I take care of a lot of the administration here at the church. And from time to time, I get the opportunity to share a message with you. We have some unhappy campers this morning. It's all right. Um, we have been working our way through the Bible in our series, The Rest of the Story. We dive into the details of the stories of the Bible that you may not have heard of or be as familiar with. We're breaking down those details to better understand what it actually says, not what we think it says or what we want it to say. We have made our way through Genesis to Joshua, and now we are in Judges, where we have seen the pattern of the Israelites getting blessings, messing it up, and then doing what they saw was right in their own eyes, and then being punished by God, and the cycle repeating itself over and over and over again. They have had many leaders through this cycle, from Moses to Joshua. Although they were not judges, the cycle of the Israelites begins with them. And now we're working our way through the judges as Jean has walked us through them so far. We've had Deborah, his common, do not underestimate a woman or anyone that you think might be the least of these because they may surprise you. Today we are in Samson, who is probably one of the most famous judges in the Old Testament. And again, you may think you know his story, but the rest of his story is actually the beginning of his story. The Israelites are going through a series of oppression. Again, blessings getting taken away and God punishing them. So they are under the rule of the Philistines at this point of the birth of Samson for about 40 years. There's a couple living in the town of Zorah, Manoah, and his wife. And interestingly, through the entire story of Samson, we never get his mother's name. I don't know why, but it's just not there. They're unable to get pregnant, and she is considered barren. That is, until one day, an angel of the Lord came and appeared to her in Judges 13, 3 through 5, and told her she would soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. There's a but. She has to follow some very strict rules. She's not allowed to drink any alcohol, eat any grapes or raisins, or eat any other forbidden food, or cut Samson's hair, his, her son's hair, and as he will be dedicated to the Lord as a Nazarite. Now, a Nazarite is someone who couldn't cut their hair, could not touch a dead body, or drink anything containing alcohol. So keep these three things in mind as Samson is growing up. And from birth, he is going to begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines, not rescue them entirely, but begin to. So, of course, she's in shock because she thinks she's barren. She takes this news and goes and tells her husband what had happened, describing the angel as terrible to see. So Manoah prays to the Lord and says, Lord, please send this angel back to give us a little more clarification and instructions on what you want us to do. The Lord hears his prayer, and the angel returns. What's interesting is, is when the angel returns and speaks to them, Manoah doesn't realize it, that it's actually an angel at the time. So the angel returns, they try to feed him, say, would you like something to eat, trying to be hospitable? He says, no thanks, I'm good. 
So they decide to offer the young goat and the grain that they had as an offering to the Lord. So they build a fire, and while the fire is burning, the angel ascends to heaven (laughs) from the flames. Not before Manoah asks him his name and says, what's your name? He says, it's too wonderful for you to understand. So after um, you see a man who can't pronounce his name to you because it's too wonderful to understand, and then flies up from the flames of the fire that you're burning into the heavens, you then realize that it's actually an angel who has visited you. (laughs) So their faces fall to the floor in to the Lord, now realizing the full realization that an angel of the Lord has appeared to them. So they are definitely going to follow all the rules that the angel gave to them, and a son is born. Not the only time an angel comes to a couple to announce the birth of a son, the most famous one, Jesus, of course. An angel comes to Mary and then also Joseph for different reasons. We know the story is very classic. He has to reassure Joseph. And, but the main point is that an angel comes to announce that a son is born in order to do God's work. So they follow the instructions, Samson is born, and they say that the Lord has blessed him while he is growing up. So he grows up into a fine young man with wonderful, original 80s glam rock hair because he's not allowed to cut his hair. So you can imagine that in your head. I didn't pull up any images because I want you to figure, just put that in your head for yourself. And if you remember what Jean has told you, Samson has actually taken a liking to a Philistine woman. Now, if you remember, Jean has told us that the Israelites are not allowed to marry foreign women. There's a good reason for this, aside from the fact that it's in the law, because obviously they don't believe or listen to everything that's actually, they believe the law, but they don't listen to what's in the law. Exodus 34, 15 through 17, in Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4, they're not supposed to marry foreign brides, so they don't worship their pagan gods. So Samson's parents say, "Uh, Samson, isn't there a woman in our tribe that you'd be more interested in marrying rather than a pagan wife? And Samson says, no, I want you to go get that woman for me in the town of Timnah where I saw her. They could have refused her, but they didn't realize that the Lord was at work with this situation to create something that's going to work against the Philistines. So on the way to Timnah, it seems, although it's not very specific, Samson and his parents take separate directions to Timnah. Samson's attacked by a lion in Judges 14, 5 through 7, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He's able to rip the lion's jaw apart as if it's a young goat. Jewish Hercules here, insert imagination. And with his bare hands, so key detail of this story is he does not tell his parents about the encounter with the lion. You would think that that would be something to be like, yo, guys, do you realize what just happened to me on my way here? I almost got killed by a lion. I tore it apart. Nope, doesn't tell him. So, They go to Timnah, make the arrangements, go back home. Now they have to come back to Timnah some time later. Again, they take separate roads. Samson decides to take the path where he left the lion carcass. He passes across it and realizes that some bees have made some honey inside of the lion. I don't know about you, but first of all, I'm not going to go near a dead lion. Second of all, a beehive. He's hungry, I guess, decides to eat some of the honey, takes some of the honey out of the lion, decides to bring it to his parents as a gift. They eat some of the honey as well. Once again, he still has not told his parents about the lion or where he got the honey from. This is an important detail. Seems trivial, but it's important. (laughs) So Samson's father is making final wedding preparations, and and Samson is thrown a party at Timnah, which is a custom for young elite men at that time. The bride's parents saw him and chose 30 men in the town to be his companions, kind of our version of groomsmen. Samson, you know, he's got to kill some time, says, hey, I got a riddle for you. If you can solve it, I'll give you 30 fine robes and 30 sets of festive clothing. Okay, if they get it wrong, then they have to give it to him. Like, sure, how hard could the riddle be? So they agreed, and then Samson gives them the riddle. Out of one who eats came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. So three days goes by, no one can figure it out. They decide to go to Samson's wife and tell her that if you don't get the answer from Samson, we're going to burn your father's house down with you inside of it. Okay, so the bride, of course, under threat of death and terrified of this, goes to Samson in tears. Judges 14, 16 through 20. 
So Samson's wife came to him in tears and said, you don't love me. You hate me. You have given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even given the answer to my father or mother. Why should I tell you? So she cried whenever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. I'm going to sidestep here for a second. What a Debbie Downer. (laughs) Every day for her wedding, she's crying. But we have to remember, she's under threat of death that her father's house is going to be burned with her inside of it. So she's going to cry every day to get this answer from Simpson. Hopping back in. At last, on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. (laughs) Then she explained the riddle to the young men. So before the sunset of the seventh day, the men of the town came to Samson with their answer. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson replied, (laughs) it's hard, it's funny to read. If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, (laughs) you wouldn't have solved my riddle. Again, I'm going to sidestep out of here for a second. Obviously, we don't call our wives heifers anymore or at all. (laughs) You might get nagged further and or hit. Remember, don't underestimate a woman. So what that actually means, if you haven't manipulated my wife, you wouldn't have gotten the answer. He would hope that they had actually figured it out for themselves. So we're going to step back in, 19. (laughs) Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to the town of Ashkelon, killed 30 men, took their belongings, and gave their clothing to the men who had solved his riddle. Samson has a bit of a temper. Samson was furious about what had happened, and he went back home to live with his father and mother. So his wife was given in marriage to the man who had been Samson's best man at the wedding. Makes sense, I guess. Wife left at altar, best man standing there. Hey, not going to leave her alone. You can marry the best man. Awesome. Right. Samson doesn't get the memo. He's back home, furious, calming down his temper, says, you know what, maybe I should go back and see my wife, whom I married, and I'll bring her a gift. So young goat, okay, I don't ever buy me a young goat. <laughs> But says, all right, I'm going to go see my wife. Brings her a young goat, goes to her house, and the father won't let her in to his wife's room. He holds it, tells him, Judges 15 too. I truly thought you must hate her, her father explained, so I gave her a marriage to your best man. But look, her younger sister is even more beautiful than she is. Marry her instead. Okay, but Samson wanted the wife that he actually married, not the younger sister. So he vows now angry, tells the father, I cannot be blamed for everything I'm about. I'm going to do to you Philistines. Okay. So this is where the story gets even more interesting. So the first means of revenge. Now remind you that he's already killed the lion. (laughs) He now decides, Judges 15, 3 through 5, Samson captures 300 foxes. And I want you to consider the logistics for a second here of capturing 300 foxes. How long that may have taken, I, I don't know. They don't give you the details. That's where you can insert your imagination. Now when he captures the 300 foxes, he decides to fasten a torch to each pair of the tails. Now if you remember what Gene said about the torches last week, they don't burn out very easily. So he has to fasten pairs of foxes to two torches. So now I have 150 pairs of foxes. He lights them on fire and sends them through the grain fields of the Philistines. Their sheaves, their uncut grain, and not only do they ruin all of their grains, crops, their vineyards, and olive groves as well. So you can only imagine how furious the Philistines are going to be over this loss of grain, vineyards. Uh, Samson doesn't care because he can't drink alcohol or grapes anyway, but they're olive groves as well. So that is a huge loss to them. But I want to paint this funny picture for you that you've got pairs of foxes on fire jumping through these fields. And that's what Samson comes up with as his first means of revenge against the Philistines. <laughs> All right. So now they need to figure out who in the world did this to them. And they found out Samson. That's going to be like a bad word to them. He did it, they found out, because the father-in-law in Timna gave his bride away to the best man. So guess what the Philistines do? They get the father and the bride and then burn them to death. So now the bride, who tried to avoid getting put in the fire, is now burned to death, and it fulfills the original threat that she betrayed Samson in the wedding in the first place. So interesting full circle. He uses the fire, she's burned in the fire. So anyway, really interesting. 
Samson has now vowed he is going to be on a cycle of revenge, that he would not rest until he had taken his revenge on them. He continues to attack the Philistines, kills many of them, and then decides to live in a cave in the rock of Edom. The Philistines retaliate, of course, setting up a camp in Judah. The men of Judah ask the Philistines, um, why is this happening? Why have you decided to camp next to us? They said it was because of Samson, and they came to capture him for what he had done to them. Judges 15, 11 through 16. So 3,000 men of Judah went down to get Samson at the cave in the rock of Edom. Makes sense. Samson, 3,000 men, 3,000 to one, should be a decent ratio to capturing Samson. Mind you, they're also Jews. So they went to Samson and said, don't you realize the Philistines rule over us? What are you doing to us? Samson replied, I only did to them what they did to me. Great answer. But the men of Judah told him, we have come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. All right, Samson said, but promise that you won't kill me yourselves. We will only tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines, they replied. We won't kill you. So they tied him up with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. Right, two new ropes. Samson, it's like putting Superman in handcuffs. It's obviously just for show. As Samson arrives at Le Lehi, Forgive me, I don't know how to pronounce that properly. I'm guessing, Lehi. The Philistines came shouting in triumph. They think they've captured Samson. But the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. He snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrists. Then he found, it's interesting again, the jawbone of a recently killed donkey. I can't make this up. He picked it up and killed a thousand Philistines with it, Philistines with it and then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. Now, I'm guessing in the original language that had a better rhyme to it, but certainly not a nursery rhyme you're going to tell your kids before they go to bed at night. So Samson only needed a jawbone of a donkey, a recently killed donkey, to kill a thousand men, but also with the power of the Lord inside of him. So after this incident, it says that Samson judges over Israel for 20 years. We don't get any details about him judging what happened while he was judging, just that he is a judge over the Israelites for 20 years while the Philistines dominated the land. Then we get another part of the story, a brief story where Samson carries away the gates of Gaza on a night that he spent with a prostitute. His Achilles heel is obviously women. They're going to capture him. So of course they hear Samson's in town. They decide, all right, we're going to get Samson in the morning. Samson decides instead at midnight, he's going to take hold of the doors and the gates of the town and carry them away. Now, I don't know about you. No, Jean has told you. I love watching my historical dramas. I'm a history nerd, used to be a history teacher. City gates in ancient civilizations were extremely important. That was the only way in and usually only way out unless there were ports. They're usually like, can we find another way into the town? It's a one way in, one way out. So it's a line of defense. It's extremely important. And so Samson decides to, again, imagination, lift the gates of the town. Can't imagine how tall the walls are carries them away, not just like a couple of steps, over 30 miles to Hebron. So he really had to make a show of his strength, now leaving them vulnerable. So the gates of Gaza are now left wide open. They have to rebuild the gates. He is costing the Philistines a ton of money and aggravation with his cycle of revenge. So now comes the final piece of Samson's story, probably the part that you all know in his famous love story with the infamous... You guys know her name? Delilah, yes, Delilah. Hey there, Delilah. She has a plan for Samson. He falls in love with her. It doesn't say, but we assume that she's another Philistine woman like his first wife. Her name, meaning seductive, is a wordplay on the Hebrew name of Layla, which means night or dark, which is kind of what Samson's going to be in through this entire situation. Unknown to Samson, she's approached by the Philistine leaders. There are five of them, one for each capital city, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza. To get a hold of Samson's secret, they're going to pay her 1,100 silver pieces each. Now, I know that doesn't, you're like 5,500 5, silver pieces, big deal. Now, again, nerd inside of me, I'm like, what is that actually worth? All right, that's almost $2 million in today's money. And if you're a woman in ancient times, that means you're independently wealthy, you don't need to marry, that is a lot of money. 
And so she agrees. And she is going to go back and forth with Samson trying to get his secret so she can collect on this 5,500 pieces of silver. So she decides to ask him what makes him so strong. His first answer is, seven new bowstrings. If you tie them around me, I'll be as weak as anyone. She allows the Philistines to hide in a room. He falls asleep. She wakes him up. Samson, the Philistines are here to capture you. He breaks free, of course. It doesn't work. Second time. Now she's getting mad. You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now please tell me how you can be tied up securely. He's still not onto the fact that this is happening, right? So they buy brand new ropes that had never been used, tie him up again. Again, she lets Philistines hide, wakes him up. Same thing happens again. Now we're on a third time. She gets really mad and he says, all right, fine. Seven braids of my hair. If you tie it into the fabric of your loom and fasten it, I'll be as weak as anyone. So while he slept, now mind you, she must have had to do this very delicately because he's not allowed to drink alcohol. So he's definitely just a deep sleeper. Has to fasten his hair into her loom. <laughs> okay, not waking him up and doing so. Same thing happens again, the Philistines attack, and now she's really upset. <laughs> Finally, she nags him enough. Judges 16, 15 through 16. Then Delilah pouted. How can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? You made fun of me three times now, and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. Obviously, the women have figured out his weak point. That should have been his weak point, not necessarily the hair. So claiming that he doesn't love her, he finally gives in, tells her that it's his hair. She uh, ends up shaving it off, cuts the hair, lets the Philistines capture him. When they capture him, they gouge out his eyes and imprison him to work. So now he's become a prisoner in Gaza, kind of full circle here, where he was once there showing off his strength, left the city gates vulnerable, he is now a prisoner in Gaza, bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in prison. So kind of funny full circle. He's now bound, has no hair, and grinding grain, the grain in which that he had originally ruined from the foxes and in the town where he had ruined their gate. So they think that they have won and are going to parade a man around the man who would cause them so many problems. Funny enough, they forget about his superpower in his hair. Maybe they thought if they cut it once, it deactivated it permanently and they let it grow back while he's in prison. So imagine how long he had to be in prison for his hair to grow back fully. So one day during a festival to their god, Dagon, whom they thought had given them victory over Samson, they wanted to make a mockery of Samson and bring him out to be put on display. So Samson asks, obviously remember he's blind, to be placed between two pillars in order to support himself. And so while he's there, he asks God one last time for the power to come over him. And he takes out all of the Philistine leaders and over 3,000 Philistines in the process and sacrificing himself when the stadium comes crashing down on him. Interestingly, God allows Samson to destroy more Philistines in this moment than he killed in his entire life, all while they're worshiping their false god. So when we look at strength, Samson's strength, we're given a picture of a man who is given physically worldly strength that only works when God grants it to him. Amazing how man has craved for his leaders to have physical attributes, expecting that those worldly attributes are what are going to save us. But strength comes in many forms. Samson's was a physical one. I know for me, those of you who know me well, I love feeling physically strong. I'm very competitive. I love lifting heavy things. I used to beat boys up for lifty, living, masculating, kind of part of my personality, but I've had to put that aside a bit. I'm still working on it. But I know that that power, that strength, gives a person superiority over their world and makes you feel good about yourself. However, Christ has come in and given us an example of a different strength, an inner strength. He's given us the Holy Spirit that gives us a strength, supernatural strength, at all times, not just when we activate it, 
It cannot be seen, and it is often used in those who are considered less than and underestimated. And we see those stories time and time again in the Bible as God uses the least of these to guide us. Just look at the disciples and their stories. We've got tax collectors and sinners. Not only with that inner strength, we see another parallel with blindness. Samson being blind, one of the disciples being blinded, the most famous one being blinded physically before he can truly be able to see and do God's work is Paul. Being blinded physically is not always as debilitating as being blind when you can actually physically see. So Samson being blinded, blinded by the love for Delilah, he eventually becomes physically blind for not seeing what was right in front of him. Nagging brought Samson down. And have you ever, and it's funny to think about this, but have you ever let anyone convince you or pers- persever- uh, <laughs> persuade you to do something bad? He unfortunately suffered the consequences of not using his gift for its purpose when he was supposed to and became physically blind, but then finally able to see in the end. And he fulfilled his purpose for God in his final sacrifice. Because even when Samson could see, he was blinded by his love for Delilah. But how many times have we used our own blindness, our emotions, our fear, our love for someone to blind us against the actions that we're taking in our own lives? Isn't it so much easier to point the finger at Samson and judge him for not seeing what Delilah was doing to him? Like literally three times you read the story, you're like, dude, every time she asks you for your strength, you almost get captured, like you haven't caught on to this. How often do we see wrongdoing going on in other people's lives rather than taking that same lens and looking at our own? How much trouble would we save ourselves if we weren't so blinded by something that was keeping us from what God had for us and fulfilling his purpose for us in our, in our lives? Remember that saying, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Pretty funny in this case for Samson, right? Things are always more clear in situations when we get past them than when we were in them. Sometimes we're so close to them we can't see them when we step away. It seems easy to take Samson's inventory, judging the judge for giving in to a nagging woman. But how many of us have been overcome by our sin and then allow it to derail us from God's purpose for us? I know it's always easier to look at someone else's sin and go, wow, aren't they messed up? Don't they see how that sin is ruining their lives? Without even looking at our own. Remember, we have to take the log of our own eyes, not judge. So how can we learn from Samson? Have some wisdom and learn from his mistakes. I heard a saying once that the definition of intelligence is learning from your own mistakes. But the definition of wisdom is learning from others' mistakes. So what can we take from this? Samson had all the worldly gifts that made him a great leader. Physically strong, wealthy, feared, amazing hair. I'm sure if there were photographs, he would have photographed very well. But in the end, it was his weakness. It was in his weakness that he fulfilled his greatest victory sacrificing himself in the end to do what he was supposed to do. Being a precursor to Christ, who also sacrificed himself. Christ being a reversal of this story. Samson was the typical leader of the world. One we would have described that had all the proper attributes to make a proper leader. Christ, son of a carpenter, not physically strong, not a king, not wealthy, not a judge, Nothing in this world that would have made him great. And yet, he made the ultimate sacrifice for us. He was not a judge, not a soldier, not a king, although tempted by it, turning it down. He was a man from a humble background who would end up being the ultimate king of all kings. So now, we who are all gifted who get the wonderful blessing of the Holy Spirit and have that inner strength inside of us that has no bound and no limit, unlike Samson's physical strength that had to be given to him when the time was right. We have that inner strength that gives us a power to overcome our sins 
and those things that are holding us down around us in this world. We're human, of course. None of us are perfect. I'm raising my hand. I'm so not perfect. It's not even funny. Always working on it. But if you caught yourself judging the judge this morning, I think I might know what you are. Human. We're human. We're perfectly flawed in every way. We need a power. We are in need of the power that is greater than our own inside of us, Christ and the Holy Spirit, to overcome whatever problems we're going through. Because isn't it so much easier to point the fingers at others, judge and gossip, take other people's inventory, be self-righteous, think you know better than they do, rather than taking our own? Imagine how much further in life we would get if we just put our fingers down, spent that time that we're using talking about other people, how they're messing their lives up and perhaps fix our own. Take that time instead of watching TMZ or strolling through the gossip, reading our Bible app instead, working on ourselves. I know it's so much easier said than done. Again, progress, not perfection. But maybe, just maybe, you can not be so blind in your current life. Have that hindsight, that 2020 vision now. And allow the strength of the Holy Spirit inside of you to guide you back to wherever you need to be in your current life. Take you away from whatever sin might be holding you down. Sin that keeps you in the dark, that keeps you blind from the world around you and prevents you from fulfilling God's purpose for you in your life. So perhaps we can practice looking at ourselves. Take a few minutes at the end of each day. Perhaps see where we wronged others. Maybe apologize for it. And then maybe not do it again. That's an idea. Perhaps we can stop pointing our fingers at each other and instead turn that finger into a helping hand to help each other out of our sins. Or reach your hand up and ask for help yourself. Because asking for help, I get it. It can be one of the hardest things you ever do. But don't let that sin get the best of you. Don't worry about getting hindsight. Get the clarity now. Don't wait. Life is so short. Never know. Because all sin does is keep you dark and blinded. And we are given a gift like no other, that strength inside of us above any physical strength. It's just learning how to rely on it, rely on him, rely on one another. It's what we're here for. It's what church is here for. And allow the Holy Spirit to transform you into the best version of yourself. And I know it's hard to ask for help. Those of you who have heard my story know that is like the hardest thing I've ever, ever, ever had to do. And I still have a hard time because I still think I've got it. And I have to remember that asking for help is the best thing I've ever done. It can be the best thing that you ever do in your life and for everyone around you. So don't wait. Don't take it for granted. Don't wait to suffer the consequences like Samson did, living in a life of revenge, resentfulness, and anger. He had to suffer the consequences before he could fulfill his purpose. Learn from the story. Don't judge the judge. Use the judge as a good, bad example of what not to do. Don't let it be another passing story on a Sunday morning. Let God guide you. Let go. Let God. Let us help and let him help. Because remember, above all, we love you. And most importantly, he loves you. Thank you. Thank you.